Okay, so welcome back. Um, I hope you had a good week and everything. And I'm going to continue talking about antibiotic resistance tonight. So where we left off last time was talking about the mechanism of action of one particular antibiotic, penicillin. And what we're going to do now is start going through different types of mechanisms or modes of action. Often we write MOA if you ever see that. So one of the thing about the antibiotics, they can be classified as either bacteriostatic or bactericidal. And the difference is the bactericidal antibiotic actually kills the bacteria. So when you add the antibiotic to this population, the cells, as we saw with penicillin, just explode or die in some way. So they're dead. So it's very easy to see how they work. But some types of antibiotic are bacteriostatic. And what that means is when you add the antibiotic, they don't actually die. They're not dead as such, but they stop growing. There's no further cell division. So my first question for you tonight, if an antibiotic is only bacteriostatic instead of bactericidal, why do you think they're still useful in the treatment of infections? If you, give, you have an infection, we give you a bacteriostatic antibiotic, it works. Why? Do you want to discuss for two minutes? We're not, you know, completely inactive in this process. All right? We normally fight infections all the time. We have an immune system which can take care of small infections in general. And if you use an antibiotic that is bacteriostatic, you're essentially helping the body by stopping the infection. There are smaller numbers, and then the body can, uh, can use the immune system to clear the remaining bacteria from your body. So that's why bacteriostatic uh, antibiotics work. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the different types of antibiotics and what they do. And I showed you this last week, this scheme, to remind you. And what I'm going to do today is go into more detail because antibiotics target all of these processes. So the first one I want to talk about is DNA polymerase. The DNA is replicated when, it goes, when a cell goes through cell division. You need a copy of the DNA. And there are antibiotics that target DNA polymerase or the, the process of DNA replication. I'm going to go into detail on one of them. First, let me just remind you a little about DNA again. So DNA is a double-stranded helix, and it has two kinds of base pairs. There's A, or adenine, and T, thymine. And A always binds to T, and C, cytosine, always binds to G, guanine. It, the little ribbon on the outside is the phosphate backbone. So these always base pair in a predictable way. So when you want to replicate, it's a very easy way to keep the sequence identical every generation. Because if there is an A on one side, you know there should be a T on the other side. I'm going to show you that in more detail. So what happens when you're going to replicate the DNA? You pull the two strands apart. There are enzymes that do that. And then you have an enzyme called DNA polymerase, which binds to what we call the replication fork, where it's splitting, and begins to synthesize new DNA based on what the sequence of one of the strands is. So putting the complementary base pairs in there. Any questions about that? Now, there's one other thing about DNA that I need to tell you, which is DNA is supercoiled. So it's this double helix, but it's not a loose double helix, so to speak. It gets wound up in a very specific way. that is called supercoiling, as shown here. And this uh, allows it to be packaged, for one thing, in a smaller space. Because as I said last time, DNA is very, very, very long, and you need to compact it. 
And the enzymes that do this are called topoisomerases. And what they do is introduce this supercoiling into the DNA. And now I'm going to show you a little video. I'll talk over it. Which shows you how topoisomerases work during DNA replication. So when you are going to separate these strands, as you can see here, these ladies are separating them, the DNA in front of it gets all tangled up because there is some kind of tension in the DNA strand. It makes a big mess. So what topoisomerases do, there are two types. One type takes one of the strands of DNA and separates it, cuts it, and then reseals it after unwinding it. Topoisomerase 2 comes in and it cuts with the help of ATP, <laughs> shown there. It cuts both strands of the DNA with ATP and then unwinds it and then seals it up again. As shown there. Now the only thing wrong with how she is doing this is that the enzyme always holds on to both ends. So that otherwise it would lose the ends. It wants to connect back together. There you go. <laughs> and the ATP is hydrolyzed as ADP. So the DNA must be unwound during replication. All right. The DNA gets tension in it because you're pulling it apart and because of the supercoiling. So topoisomerases, or another name is gyrase, need to do the unwinding of the DNA so that the DNA replication can continue. The other place you need topoisomerase is at the end of replication. So when remember, it's a circular DNA in bacteria. At the end of replication, when both are replicated, the two daughter chromosomes end up linked together. That's just how it ends up. And so these can't separate. And so they use a special topoisomerase to separate the two strands of DNA at the end of replication. Questions about that? All right, the reason I'm telling you this is that one of the antibiotics works by affecting this process. Fluoroquinolones are a class of antibiotics which work by targeting topoisomerase. Depending on which one, uh, some attack uh, DNA gyrase and some other topoisomerases. In this example, it's DNA gyrase. DNA gyrase comes into DNA and it cuts both strands as shown in the example, and holds on to them so they can unwind and then put them back together again. The problem when you add fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin, it binds to DNA gyrase, it cuts the DNA, the gyrase, and it can't put them back together. What that means is that then over time the DNA gyrase falls apart and now you've introduced a double strand break in the DNA. So now the DNA is separated. And that's really, really bad for the bacteria. It's very hard for bacteria in particular to deal with double strand breaks. So fluoroquinolones, as I said, is a class. There are a number of different fluoroquinolones. And this shows the basic structure on the left here. And what you see is this basic structure with an F, which is a fluor fluoride group, where it gets its name. And this center part is the quinolone part of the molecule. The different fluoroquinolones have different substitutions in the positions marked R. So they're different in different versions of the drug. In particular, here's ciprofloxacin. It has, you see, the same basic structure. But the different R groups have different groups depend, uh, for ciprofloxacin. So later generations of fluoroquinolones have been modified to work primarily on topoisomerase 2. 
And topoisomerase 2 is the one that inhibits this daughter strand separation I talked about. And the reason they've done this is they work really well against gram-positive bacteria. So the result on the bacteria of treating with fluoroquinolones is the following. You block DNA replication. You create double strand breaks in the DNA. It can also cause mutations. If the cell tries to fix the problem, problem it usually does it wrongly, or it often does it wrongly. And it ultimately leads to bacterial cell death. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next target. And that's the next step of this process. So we have DNA, DNA has to be replicated. And the fluoroquinolones attack that process. The next step is that RNA polymerase needs to transcribe RNA, messenger RNA, from the DNA. There is an antibiotic called rifampicin, which targets RNA polymerase. And essentially, it, it is unable to start making RNA. So it blocks the first step of RNA polymerase. I'm not going to say much more about that, except that it's used commonly in the treatment of tuberculosis. Okay, if we move down further, we're going to go to the ribosome. So once you have RNA, you need to translate it to turn it into protein. And there are many, many antibiotics that target this process, the ribosome. Some examples are spectinomycin, tetracycline, chloramphenicol, erythromycin. And many antibiotics cause the ribosome either to totally not function or to make a lot of mistakes while it's translating. For this reason, I'm going to go into much more detail about translation so I can show you exactly where these different antibiotics work. So on the left here shows you the structure of a protein. And a protein is made of amino acids. And it's a long stretch of amino acids like that that is predictable for every protein. On the right side here is a picture of a ribosome. And it is connected to an RNA molecule shown here. And the RNA molecule has a specific sequence. What happens then is that tRNAs come in. tRNAs are like an adapter molecule. They bring the amino acids to the ribosome. And they do it because they have an RNA sequence with an anticodon that matches the RNA sequence. So you can see here that, well, first I should tell you that in RNA, instead of using T, you use U, uridine. Don't ask why, you just do do that, okay? I don't know why. Uh, it just has evolved that way. So this tRNA, for example, has ACC in the anticodon. That A matches that U. That C and C match GG. And it had just finished and is falling off. The next tRNA is UUU and it matches AAA. These tRNAs come in and attached to them is the amino acid that they're supposed to put in there. The amino acid or tRNA with the amino acid comes in. They then bind those two amino acids together and the tRNA goes away. I'm going to explain this one more time with a video. I think it's a little clearer. So here is a tRNA with a, an amino acid on it called methionine. This is the 30S ribosomal subunit. It's a small subunit. And it attaches to the mRNA and the tRNA. And then comes the large subunit and attaches. Now we have a complete ribosome. Then what's going to happen is there are, well, there are three sites here. This is known as the P site. 
That's known as the A site. And that one is known as the E site, E for exit. So now what's going to happen, the next tRNA is going to come in. And that tRNA is going to match the CCG with GGC. And it's going to bring along a proline amino acid. Now these two are going to uh, bind together. And the ribosome is going to translocate to the right, eventually. There we go. So that now the old tRNA, the first one, is in the E site and it goes away. And the new tRNA with the peptide is in the P site. And now comes the next tRNA. And then this continues along, bringing in next one, next one, next one, next one until you make the entire protein. So, if I have an antibiotic and it inhibits the ribosome, like I said, there are lots of them, do you think it's going to be bacteriostatic or bactericidal? You can discuss with your neighbor for a minute. Alive antibiotics uh, are bacteriostatic that, because they just kind of freeze protein synthesis and then they deal with what they have. They can't divide and do much else, but they're okay for quite a while. Usually they're bacteriostatic, but they can be bactericidal. Under bactericidal conditions, the ribosome functions, but it makes so many mistakes that it makes quote unquote bad protein. And it starts filling up the cell with proteins that are garbage. They're not the correct sequence. And that can cause many problems, including or especially that some of these bad proteins can end up in the membrane of the cell. And we talked last week about how affecting the membrane and the cell wall can really mess up a cell. So they end up in the, pro the bad proteins end up in the membrane they can actually cause the cell to lice or explode. So usually it's bacteriostatic, but it can be bactericidal. Is that clear? Okay, so now let's look, now we have to go back to my terrible drawings, but uh, we're gonna look a little more closely at what the different antibiotics do. So as you saw in the video, you first have this step where you connect the mRNA, the small subunit, the large subunit, and the first tRNA together to make a working ribosome. There are some antibiotics, including casugamycin, which inhibits the assembly of that first uh, process. So this never can form, so we can't make a new protein. If we look at the cycle here that was in the video, Here's a ribosome that's partially made some protein. In comes the tRNA. It goes into the A site. And then it has peptide transfer so that it catalyzes the connection between the two different amino acids. Then it moves, oh, sorry. Here it connects. And then it moves to the right. So the tRNA ends up in the P site again and the other one falls off. There are antibiotics that affect every step here. So doxycycline, which is a common antibiotic, blocks the delivery of new tRNAs to the ribosome. So no tRNAs with their amino acids come to a ribosome, you stop making proteins. Chloramphenicol blocks the formation of the peptide bond between the new amino acid and the peptide that's already there. And then spectinomycin is an example of an antibiotic that prevents the transfer of the tRNA from the A site into the P site. 
So all of these steps can be inhibited. And there's, I've only put one example for each of these steps. There are probably five or six for each one. So there are more than 20 types of uh, ribosomal antibiotics. Antibiotics that affect the ribosome. They bind differently depending on the antibiotic. Some of them bind to a small subunit of the ribosome. Some bind to a large subunit of the ribosome. And they also, some of them bind to factors that are involved that I didn't show you that help with translation. For example, the one that delivers the tRNA. There's another protein involved there. So there are many different steps. So these are the ribosomal antibiotics. There are other antibiotics that can affect metabolism. In particular, there's one type which is actually used as a combination drug, which is trimethoprim and sulfonamide. These two antibiotics affect the same pathway in the cell, which is uh, processing PABA, P-aminobenzoic acid, through to tetrahydrofolic acid. And this is essential for many reactions in the cell. They use this folic acid for many different things in the cell. So this will cause the cell not to grow if you add these two. And it inhibits, as I should say, two steps in the pathway. Another type of antibiotic targets the membrane. And these are the polymyxins. Polymyxins target the gram-negative bacteria specifically because they bind to something called lipopolysaccharide. They work like a detergent to dissolve the membrane. And I'll show you a picture because I didn't mention lipopolysaccharide last time. So remember that the gram-negative bacteria have two membranes. What I left off in the pictures last week is that there's another molecule here on the surface embedded in the outer membrane that is called lipopolysaccharide. It's written there, which is a lipid that's in the membrane and then this polysaccharide that's pointing out. Polymyxins work by recognizing or binding to that lipopolysaccharide and then attacking the membrane. And they actually can dissolve both the outer and inner membrane. And this, of course, is going to be lethal. Antibiotics often target processes that are important for both the bacteria and for our cells. For example, protein translation in the ribosome is essential for human cells as well as bacteria. Why do you think antibiotics only make the bacteria cells die or stop growing? but do not affect our cells. So essentially, antibiotics often target structures that are not present in our cells. For example, the cell wall. Human cells don't have a cell wall, so penicillin won't have an effect on them. But in addition, the antibiotics that do target common structures, like the ribosome, bind to proteins that are significantly different between humans and bacteria so that we don't get toxic effects. All right, so we keep talking, I've been talking about antibiotics and how they work, where they come from. In the case of penicillin, I've already told you, the drug is produced by a fungus. Other antibiotics are produced by some bacteria. Polymyxins are produced by gram-positive bacteria, but they target gram-negative bacteria. In particular, Streptomyces, which is a common soil bacteria, is thought to produce hundreds of different antibiotics. That's where Streptomycin was isolated. And in addition, a few antibiotics have been developed by chemists in the lab. For example, fluoroquinolones. So now one question, why do you think bacteria and fungi are making antibiotics? They're often produced by bacteria to kill off the competition. 
Bacteria compete for nutrients in the environment. So in the case of Streptomyces, it must be working really hard to kill off everything around it to make, um, uh, so that it gets most of the nutrients. I should mention, producing an antibiotic for a bacteria is expensive. They need to make proteins, they have to devote energy uh, and nutrients to making the antibiotic. So it must be worth it in the case of Streptomyces because they are winning, obviously, since they've evolved to have this. So a summary of what I just told you. Here shows a cell, uh, and this shows the different targets of antibiotics. We have the beta-lactams, which were the penicillins, that target the cell wall. Vancomycin, I'll come to a little layer, also targets the cell wall. Polymyxins directly target the membrane. All of these on the right here target protein synthesis, which some attach to the 30S subunit and some to the 50S subunit. You have RNA polymerase, which is targeted by rifampicin. You have DNA gyrase, which is attacked by the quinolones. And then you have those involved in folate synthesis that are uh, inhibited by trimethoprin and sulf uh, sulfonamides. So everything is targeted, basically. All right. And one of the dreams, and we'll talk more about this in a later lecture, is to find new targets for antibiotics, things that we haven't explored yet. So, because obviously we're, we're targeting a lot of things, but we're not targeting everything. So now, finally, we're getting to what the reason why you took the course, which is resistance. And what's shown here is an auger plate where bacteria have been spread all over the plate and they're white-ish here. And each of these little discs show a, or include a different antibiotic. So on the left side, you can see that around this disc, all the cells are dead, or they're not growing at least, because it's not white, it's clear. All right, so they've either been killed or inhibited from growing. On the right side is a multiply drug resistant bacteria. And what you can see for two of these, there's no effect whatsoever. For two others, there's a small effect of the uh, antibiotic on them. And three of them look, or two of them look pretty normal. This one, it's hard to tell in the center. So this is a multiply drug resistant bacteria. And this is one way we measure uh, drug resistance by measuring, uh, or drug sensitivity, by measuring the halo the area around that little disc in the middle. And if it gets smaller, then they're more resistant to the antibiotic. On this slide is a summary of what I'm going to tell you in the next half hour or so. On the left, it again shows you all the targets of antibiotics. And on the right side, shows you the different mechanisms that can be used to become resistant to the antibiotic. And you can see it's been separated into the different types of antibiotics that include different kinds of resistances. So there are four major classes or types, and I'm going to talk about each of them in detail. These are efflux, immunity or bypass, target modification, and inactivating enzymes. And I'll start with inactivating enzymes. So an example of inactivating enzymes is penicillin resistance. So you remember that penicillins have this basic structure shown on top. And in the center here is this square uh, structure. And that is the beta-lactam ring. And all the penicillins have a beta-lactam ring. We can call them beta-lactams, in fact. This is penicillin. The R shows where you can have substitutions for different types of penicillins. And this is cephalosporin, which is a related molecule. It also has a beta-lactam structure in the center, but it has some differences out here 
in that it has a different structure by the sulfite group here. So these are two common types of antibiotics. This is what the enzyme beta-lactamase does. Beta-lactamase, shown here, takes that beta-lactam structure and cuts it. It put, just puts a snip in that molecule, leaving two ends which then uh, rearrange and a carboxyl group falls off, creating a molecule here that is totally ineffective against bacteria. So it simply destroys the antibiotic. And these beta-lactams can be, um, we have cells in the lab, they actually get secreted into the media and they kill, they inactivate all the penicillin in the neighborhood, so to speak. Is that clear? So one approach is destroy the antibiotic. And what has happened over time is that we've gotten more and more problems with penicillin resistance. And what has happened is there's some, the original beta-lactams have evolved to produce something called extended spectrum beta-lactams, or ESBL. And I mentioned those last week briefly. These beta-lactamases work against second and third generation beta-lactams, which are the cephalosporins, or include the cephalosporins that I showed the structure of before. These are becoming an increasing problem in the world, in Sweden, in Europe, etc. And I'll show you that here. This, and sorry, this isn't so clear. This is resistance of Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is a gram-negative bacteria that causes pneumonia. Resistance to third-generation cephalosporins in Europe. The red is bad, let's just put it that way. The highest level here, which is down here, is more than 75% of cases of Klebsiella pneumoniae infections were re had ESBL phenotypes and could not be treated with either penicillins or the cephalosporins, third generation cephalosporins. And you can see up in Sweden, we're, as I said, we're doing a little better. We're at one to 5%. This is one particular bacteria though. A second bacteria here is E. coli, also showing resistance to third generation cephalosporins. And this is 2015, by the way. And this shows Sweden's doing quite well with very low numbers, but again, very big problems south. I want to just point out to you, so this slide is 2015. This slide is 2005. This happens very, very rapidly. So if you look at Italy, 10 years ago, Italy was in fairly good shape, and now it's all red. So this type of ESBL bacteria are spreading incredibly rapidly. And the last type of beta-lactam I want to mention are the carbapenems, and they're our real fear right now. A relatively new beta-lactam uh, is carbapenem that's used against ESBL. It again has this central structure, but the parts around it have been modified. And the problem with them right now is resistance was first described in 2003, and a second type in 2008. It was actually identified in Sweden for the first time ever in 2008 from someone who had gone on holiday to India. And this is our current situation in resistance to carbapenems for one bacteria, Klebsiella pneumoniae. And already in Southern Europe, it's very bad. Sweden's still doing fine, but it's been detected here and will continue to spread. So, questions, and then after that dep depressing little interlude, we'll take a pause. <laughs>